Today, on Commitment to Truth. See, if you believe in your heart, I used to tell my kids, <clears throat> I used to tell my kids that you'll show me how much you love me by how you care for the things I give you. If I give you a toy and you throw it up against the wall and smash it into pieces, I'm going to think you don't think very much of me. Well, I think God acts the same way. I think we show God how much we love Him by how we care for what He gives us. Welcome to Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Each week, Pastor Cedric Brown and the pastoral team at Commitment Church strive to draw you into a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we begin a series titled, Life After Death. You may think that life after death speaks of only when our physical bodies pass away, but what about the life after death here on earth? This is what we call being born again. This sermon series will describe how to live our lives after we have died to ourselves and live a life crucified in Christ. Here's Pastor Ken Jones, teaching pastor at Commitment Church, with today's message. So, this second life. What is this second life? I told you we're born again, right? Well, if you're born, something had to die, didn't it? If you're being born, you're, you're not alive. But yet you were alive. That's good. That's, before I confuse you to death, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So here we are in our life before Christ, and we're doing certain things, and we're walking a certain way. We trust Christ as Savior. We come face to face with Jesus Christ, our sin, his payment, and we start walking the other way. It's a whole new life. And the old is gone, and the new has come. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24 say that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. So we got to lay it aside. The old man that was living in sin, that was, we had life with before Christ, we now need to lay aside. We have a responsibility to do so. Remember, Christ did all the work on the cross so that we didn't have to die. But that old person that was living a certain kind of life did need to die. And it's our responsibility to lay it aside. And if you notice, it said there that that corruption in accordance, we're being continually corrupted. And I always picture David, as, as, to me, as a beautiful picture of how sin begets sin begets sin. Because once you start to walk in sin, you'll keep going deeper and deeper and deeper until you stop. And think of David. Because David started with his sin in a very small way. He was where he wasn't supposed to be. His army's out in the battle, and he's sitting at home with his feet up watching TV. And he wasn't with his army where he belonged. Sin number one. Then he decides to go for a walk. Are you going to tell me for a minute David didn't know where he was going for a walk? He knew darn right well he was going to be walking out on that porch over top of where the women were taking baths. And there were going to be naked women down there, and he knew it. And you know it. Sin number two. Of course, then that walk where he shouldn't have walked led him to lust after the flesh that he never should have, and he ended up having an affair with Bathsheba. Sin number three. But then he decides he's going to cover that sin, so he brings Uriah, her husband, back to try to cover up the sin, which didn't work. Sin number four. And then he ends up murdering Uriah. So just being where you're not supposed to be ended up in murder. And this is from the man after God's own heart. Are we any better? And that's how easy it is to fall back into that trap of that old life. Verse 23 of Ephesians chapter 4. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self 
which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. So we have a responsibility to lay that old life aside and put on, just like a jacket, the new life. We have to do it. We have to put it on. And it's in truth. And where's truth? In the Word of God. If we're going to live like God, how are we going to know? I, I, I was telling folks in the first service, um, I have a tendency to break phones. I'm a bit of a klutz. So I end up getting new phones. Well, you get a new phone, I need to sync it with my car so my Bluetooth works. I have no idea how to do that. So what do I do? I reach in the glove box, pull out the owner's manual, figure it out. Okay, I'm synced, put it away, I'm good. Huh? Then hits daylight savings. Oh, shucks, my clock's off. I don't know how to change the clock. So I open up the glove box, pull out the owner's manual. You get where I'm going here? This is our owner's manual. Every single thing we need to know about how to live a life for Jesus Christ is right here. But if we don't open the manual, we'll never know. It's really that simple. You want to put on the new life? Pick up the manual and figure out what it is. You want to put down the old life? Pick up the manual and figure out how to get rid of it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who was being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Romans 6, 4. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Then this is the point, folks. If you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior, if you've come face to face with your sin and the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ and his blood to save you from that sin, you are dead. That old man that you used to be is dead. It's in the grave. And we are new. We are born again. And herein lies the second life the life that we now live with Christ. Now, here's the problem. We keep jumping down in that grave and giving CPR to that dead body. And we res that sucker back up again, and we come back out here and start walking in our sin. And then the Holy Spirit goes, what in the world are you doing? Then we stab that sucker and throw it back in the grave again. But here's what happens. We start walking in our sin. Oh, shucks, nothing going to do that. We walk back. No, I really want to do this over here. There's no walking. And we end up walking in circles. And we can become Christians walking in circles going nowhere. Paul says, forgetting those things that are behind, I press on towards the mark of the calling of God in Christ Jesus. We need to press on. We need to move forward and forget that stuff that was left behind. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it's gone. At the moment we met Jesus Christ, your sin was removed from you as far as the east is from the west, buried in the deepest sea, just as if you never committed that sin. So why are we still carrying it around? Because it's gone. Shucks, the sin I did this morning's gone. But what happens is we keep carrying this old self, this old life, this sin that we used to do, and we become miserable Christians. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And who in the world wants to be around a miserable Christian? Why would I want to be a Christian if you're going to be miserable? When I was at the end of my 15 years of running away from God, and I was miserable, wretched, disgusted with my life, and just absolutely in a mess. I looked at my life and said, when was I happiest? When did I have joy? And I looked back to when I was a teenager, and I was living for the Lord. And I realized that that was the most joyous time in my life. And I needed to go back there. And I surrendered. And I'm here to tell you, 
I've had a heck of a lot more fun since August 15th, 1988, when I finally surrendered my life to Jesus Christ that I had in those 15 years of mess. Sin is fun for a season, but its end is death. Thank you for joining us for today's message from Commitment to Truth. We'll continue with the second part of the message right after this. Act like a man. Woman, can you help me? 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 says, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. These explosive words could and should ignite a sense of responsibility within the heart of every man across the planet, or at least in the heart of you, the reader. You can purchase this book and others by Cedric Brown at cedricbrown.com. Thank you again for joining us for today's message from Commitment to Truth. We now return for the second half of our message. So, we can finally get to the sermon series. <laughs> what does this second life look like? And we're going to spend the next four weeks figuring out how we are to live this second life. Because that's our job, is to help you understand what God says in his word. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Never mind, let's go to James. Woo! I get ahead of myself. James 1.1. 1, 1. First of all, it's a life of service. James 1.1 1, 1 says, James, a bondservant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. We're bond servants. James was Jesus' half-brother. And yet he considered himself a bond servant to Christ. Now what does it mean? Well, the actual definition, the actual translation of the word bond servant is slave. Now, of course, when you say the word slave, Satan has done a great job of making the connotation of that word very disgusting because it was an evil, terrible thing that was depicted on a group of people that never should have had it happen. But that's not the slavery we're talking about here when we're talking about this word. This word is bond servant, and it's a little bit different. And let me see if I can explain it this way. Back when the United States first came to be, okay, people were coming from Europe and England and wanted to come to the New World. However, they couldn't afford it. So they go to some rich guy and say, hey, if you pay my passage on the ship going over to the New World, I will pay you, I'll get a job over there and I'll pay you back. I will be your servant until you're paid back. Bond servant. And that person was bonded to that person who paid the price for the passage to the New World. Most of the time for the rest of their lives. Jesus Christ paid the price for our passage to heaven. And we owe him a debt. And that's the concept of the bond servant that we're talking about here. The difference is, in this one, we voluntarily take the position of slave to Christ. And because we do that, we have no rights. And we have no will of our own. What does that mean? Well, if I choose to do something that I want to do without it being what's it's in God's will, then means I have the right to choose that. Yes, I do. But I'm telling you, the way is death. What we need to be is a bondservant to Christ who's obedient to his will. Which, of course, we're not going to know what it is again unless we're back in the owner's manual. Second point, it's a life perfected by trials. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to pretend that trials are pleasant or I'm having so much fun in this trial. No. Remember there's a difference between joy and happiness. Right? Happiness is you know, smiley, laughy, yee Joy is just that inner feeling that you get because you know how the story ends. 
So there's no reason to really get ourselves all worked up about the trial that we're in because we already know how the story ends. Look, if you're a believer, then your job is to have an eternal perspective on this life. Because we're not living this life for this life. We're living this life for eternity. See, one day we're going to stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat. And at that judgment seat, we're going to give account for everything we've done for him. Nothing else. So everything you do, if it's not done for him, when you stand before him on your way into heaven, will not be there. It won't matter. How big your car was, how big your house was, how many kids you had, none of that stuff matters unless it's done for Jesus Christ and him alone. And that's the whole point of this. This life that we now live, we live for Christ, not for ourselves. Because for eternity, we're going to live with him. James tells us that this life is a vapor that passes away. And you've heard me explain this before. It's like walking outside in the wintertime, and you exhale, and that little piece of breath comes out and then goes away. That's what this life is like compared to eternity. We are going to live forever with Jesus Christ. Why are we worried about this life? Why do we get ourselves all wrapped up in it? Look, I've had over 120 chemo treatments. And if God decides to take me home tomorrow with my cancer, yippee! Because it's his will. I'm not saying it's not going to be sad. Of course, he tells us to mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who meet. Of course, it's sad when you separate from loved ones. But eternity. It's like they're going away for a while. We'll catch up. I'm blessed. All of my immediate family is saved. So my mom, my dad has already died, my kids, my grandkids, my wife. Man, I got it made. And I'd be naive to think that you all are in the same spot. So what's that mean? It puts pressure on you, doesn't it? To take this second life of being born again that God has given us and make it shine so that others are going to want this too. We can't be afraid to tell people that they're bound for a Christless eternity and it's not a fun place to be. People need to hear that this life ain't it because this life can be pretty sucky. And we're supposed to find joy in that. Without Christ, you're not going to. So this trials, the other thing to remember too, by the way, is that these trials that we're supposed to have joy in, they're not temptations to sin. Because God cannot tempt you to sin. So if you're tempted to sin and you give in to it and there's a consequence in your life that really is really lousy, That's on you. No offense, but if you sin, you did it. You're going to pay the price for it. And it's kind of funny. God's kind of cool in this way. Uh, If you're a Christian and and you're acting like one and then you sin, you ain't going to get away with it. (laughs) My son will tell you. Ask him. He'll be here preaching next week. Talk to him. Ask him. Because all his friends used to do stuff and get away with it. He never got away with nothing. And he used to get so upset. Yeah. And so that's because God's called you for something else, boy. So through these trials that we go through, it produces faith and patience and endurance. Because of walking a Christian life sometimes can be hard. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that. Life is hard as a Christian. But the continual trials that God provides for us, we get more and more patient. We get better and better. We become more and more like Christ. And the trials don't seem all that bad anymore.
And of course, it says uh, um, that we would be perfect. <laughs> no, we won't. The perfect here doesn't mean perfect like sinless. It means mature. I, I, I was thinking about it with kind of like this. Um, when I was young and I was in college, I had hair down here. I had this big honking beard. Uh, I wore funny pants. We used to call them elephant bells. You guys wouldn't know what they are. Uh, I dress funny. Um, but today, I would never do that because I matured. I did a lot of silly things when I was young, things that I would never think about doing today because I've matured. And that's what James is talking about here. Our life in Christ will help us to change, to change the things that we do will become more mature and we won't do those sinful things that we used to do as we mature because we'll see them for the silliness that it is. Thank you again for listening to our series, Life After Death, From Commitment to Truth, the teaching ministry of Commitment Church, a place for all nations. We hope you are encouraged to know that life after death is not only a life of service, but also of fruitfulness. If you want to listen to the previous messages in this series, or if you want to hear messages from other series, visit Commitment Church on YouTube or Pastor Cedric Brown on Spotify, Pandora, or other podcast providers. You can also visit us on our website, commitmentchurch.org. And if you live in the Philadelphia, Delaware, or South Jersey area, we would love to see you in person as well. You can attend any of our services by visiting us at 2 Berlin Road South, Lindenwald, New Jersey, 08021. Thank you again for listening, and have a blessed and wonderful day.